Uh, have you turn your Bibles today to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. And we're still talking about the life of Noah here. Uh, getting toward the end of his life. And we come across this interesting passage of Scripture that's always been a mystery to me. And I want to just read it for you here. And we get into this question of what did Noah's son do to him? And uh, it's been an item of speculation by biblical scholars. But we're going to take a crack at it today. Uh, beginning in verse 20 of Genesis 9, it says, Then Noah began farming and planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and became drunk and uncovered himself inside his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were turned away so that they did not see their father's nakedness. And when Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants he shall be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Jacob, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Okay, so interesting passage here. And many that have speculated about what happened here assume that something immoral took place. Uh, and the reason for that is well, Noah was obviously naked. It tells us that in verses 21 to 23. And then it also says in verse 24 that Ham did something to Noah. It says when Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. And so you put those two together and you think, well, something immoral must have taken place. And here are three of the possibilities that some of the people have come up with over the years. Uh, some believe that Ham sodomized his father, Noah. Uh, I had a professor in seminary, and he believed that, uh, he leaned toward the view that uh, Ham came in and made a eunuch out of his father. Um, where he got that, I'm not sure, but that was what he really believed. And then uh, recently I heard a TV preacher, uh, and, and he's been off on a lot of things, but he's thought that Ham had relations with Noah's wife, with his own mother. I think he's off balance there, too. But uh, anyway, these are three ideas that have been purported out there, not necessarily true. Now, the problem with these three ideas is that there's nothing recorded that would suggest that. It, it doesn't, it's not in the, in the text. And you would expect something to be there. I mean, something this serious, if, it, if there was something immoral, you know, the Bible doesn't really pull punches when it comes to, to sex or immorality. Uh, think of David and Bathsheba. The uh, Bible tells it like it is, and you're all familiar with that story. Or uh, Lot, he was uh, seduced by his two daughters. And the Bible tells us all that happened there. Uh, or when Judah was seduced by his daughter-in-law in Genesis 38. It's recorded. It's, it, we're told about it. Uh, the Bible just doesn't shy away from these things. Or later uh, in David's life, when his daughter Tamar was raped by her half-brother, Amnon, in 2 Samuel 13. We're told all about it. It's right there. It's, it's given great detail about that. So the Bible is not prudish about when it comes to sexual matters. The Bible tells it like it is. It tells us what we need to know. It doesn't go into the the real details, but we're told all the you know, think about Samson and all his escapades. Uh, it's all there in Scripture. Or when Absalom had a romp with his father David's concubines, we're told about it. If it's important, it's there. We need to know it's there. So whatever happened with Noah and his son is very serious. If, if you look at the cursing and the blessing there, when Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. So he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants he shall be to his brothers. Now this is the lowest of the low. 
So whatever it is here, it's very serious in the eyes of Noah. And so we want to take a look today and see what, what exactly happened there between Noah and Ham, Noah and his son. Well, I would suggest this. Uh, Ham did something wrong. But what was his mistake? And we always want to use the principle when we're interpreting the Bible, a good rule of thumb is where the Bible speaks, we speak. Where the Bible is silent, we want to be silent. So we don't want to read in more than, than what's really here. We don't want to be adding into Scripture. The Lord has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. And, and that includes Scripture. And so what we need to know, he's given to us in his word. We don't need, need to be adding things in. So uh, anyway, look at verses 20 to 22. It says, Then Noah began farming and planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, became drunk, and uncovered himself inside his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Now, I had to read this over and over quite a few times before the Lord finally began to get some things through, through my thick skull here. But uh, first of all, we know that Ham saw the nakedness of his father. Uh, it's right there. Now, is that a sin? Well, yes, it is a sin. The Bible tells us in Leviticus 18, 7, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father. Now, we might think, well, that's kind of a trite thing. But the Bible says that's real serious. In fact, in Ezekiel 22.10, when the Lord was revealing to the prophet Ezekiel, they were already carried away into exile. They were already in Babylon. And then the Lord explained to Ezekiel, now here's why I brought you guys here. Here's why you're not in Jerusalem or in Judah anymore. And one of the reasons he, he says is they have uncovered their father's nakedness. Speaking about the people of Judea, of, of Judah, the tribe of Judah. That's why they were taken over. One of the reasons. Uh, now think about Adam and Eve. It says before they sinned that they were naked and not ashamed. But then after they sinned, after they partook of the forbidden fruit, then they became ashamed of their nakedness. And uh, the Lord says, well, why, why are you ashamed? Why are you hiding? And Adam said, remember, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. And you know, even in our society, where many of God's laws have just been brushed aside, we still have laws against indecent exposure. And that's really what was happening here with Noah. He was indecently exposed. And so Sam, or, or Ham, Sam, Ham saw... Sounds easy to say. <laughs> uh, but he saw the nakedness of his father, and it was sin. Now, it may not have been his intention to see his father naked. It doesn't say that Ham uncovered his father's nakedness. It said Noah did that. And so Ham may very innocently have stum stumbled across a situation that he really didn't want to be in. Has that ever happened to you? Or you've stumbled into things, you really didn't want to know that, you didn't really want to see that, you didn't really want them to share this with you, but they did. And you saw it, or you heard it. And now what do I do with it? Well, that may have been the situation with Ham. Because, uh, now, they were farmers. And, and keep in mind, there weren't a whole lot of people on the earth at that time. So there weren't a lot of different occupations like we have today. There probably weren't any accountants. There probably weren't any computer programmers. Uh, they were mostly farmers because, you know, they had to grow crops and they had to herd flocks because they needed to eat and they needed to sustain life. So it's probably true that not only was Noah a farmer, but his three sons as well. And it could have been that they worked together because when we work together, we get more production for our energy. And so it wouldn't be a, a stretch to say that they were in a family business together. Now, when I was a little boy, uh, my grandfather and my grand, see, my great grandfather and my grandfather, they had a farm together. They had a family farm. It was out here uh, between Monmouth and Corvallis, just this side of Suber. It's that flat land right around the Lucky Newt River. 
they all driven right through it on Highway 99. And it was a big farm, and it was their family farm, and uh, they, they were actually uh, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, and then my grandfather's brother. And then their sons got involved too, so they called the farm Elkins and Sons. And I was just a little boy at the time. Well, we have to be living with my grandparents for a little bit of time. And I can remember early mornings when those guys would gather together early in the morning and they would sort of plan out their day. Okay, today we're going to get the combines out and we're going to go cut the grain. You know, and, and they'd all plan that together and they'd meet together. Well, that could have been what was happening with Ham, that he got up early in the morning and hey, I'm going to go over to Dad's house and see what the plan is for the day. And he opens the tent door, oops, and he sees right away. Dad's been drinking. Dad was drunk. He was, he naked. He uncovered himself, and ugh, I can't see this. And so that it's sin, yes, but it could have innocently stumbled upon that. You've done that, haven't you? You've seen things you, you shouldn't have seen. You didn't want to see. You you've heard things you didn't want to hear. And yet these things happen, and what do we do with that when we, this gets sort of dumped on us? Um, years ago, I got a phone call, and uh, there was a fellow on the other end of the line, I knew this guy, and he says, you got to come over, I, I got to talk to you. And I said, okay, so I got in the car, drove over uh, to where he lived, and he, he said, uh, he was distraught. He said, I just discovered that my wife has been in an affair. And he says, I don't know what to do. And he says, you know, part of me just wants to blast this out to everybody and just expose her for what she's done to me. And I said, don't, don't do that. <laughs> Please, uh, just keep this on the quiet. Let's keep that between ourselves. And so we talked. And I said, you know, and I just encouraged him to be kind to his wife, to meet her needs, and to bend over backwards, to really go out of his way, and to show her that you love her, that you really care about her, and try to win her back. And so he said, okay, I'm going to do that. I'm going to give him a try. And so he did. About two weeks later, he called back, and he said, uh, it's not working. And I said, well, what do you mean it's not working? He said, the, the, fire, the affair is still going on. And he said, I don't know what to do. And so he wanted me to be together, and so I tried to console him, tried to, to kind of massage his, his ego, which had obviously been bruised. And, uh, but here's what he decided to do. He went, and, and he knew the, the other fellow that was involved. He knew of him. He knew he had a wife and a family. And he knew that his wife was not aware of what was going on. He went to that fellow, and he said, uh, and he talked over it with his wife as well. And, and his wife really, he really believed she wanted to get out of this affair. But he said, why is it still going on? And he says, well, she, well, uh, she said, he, he just won't leave me alone. And it was a situation where they actually worked together. So they were with each other quite a bit. He wouldn't leave her alone. So he went to this other fella, and he said, you know what? Uh, I, I know what's happened. And uh, I fully forgive my wife. I love my wife, and I want to save my marriage. And he says, this affair is, is over. What's happened has happened, and I've forgiven her. It's all in the past. But he said, it's, it's over now. And he said, I really want to keep this just between us, just between you and me. He said, I really don't want to bring your wife into this. I really don't want to tell her this. But he said, if you continue to pursue this, then you leave me no alternative than to let your wife know what's going on as well. Well, you know what? That affair came to an end. He did the right thing. Now, let me tell you another story. Um, when Tim was younger, he was on baseball teams. It was summertime, just like it is now. And he was on a baseball team, and so, it, I would take him, at that time there were batting cages over in West Salem. And so uh, I would take him over and have him practice his batting in the batting cages. So one uh, day we were doing that, and as we did, I saw a lady there that I knew. And she was married to a fellow that I knew. And she was with another man. And I thought that 
rather strange. And she saw me there and she was very nervous and came up and tried to explain that this was a friend of a friend and we both knew it wasn't. And so I thought, ah, here's one of these situations where you really don't want to see this kind of thing, but okay, you stumbled onto it and now what do you do? And so I thought, I gotta do the right thing here. So when we got home, I called that lady's husband and I said, uh, it was something. I told him what happened. I said, you, you need to talk to your wife and see what's going on here and get this thing straightened out. And uh, so I did. Now, of those two stories, the first couple, that marriage was saved. The one who, he went to the husband, he confronted, or the, the guy in the fair, he confronted that. That marriage survived and is still surviving to this day and this happened years ago. The second marriage failed. And one of the reasons it failed is because I made a mistake <coughs> in that second instance. And what was the difference? In Matthew 18, 15, you know what it says. It says, if your brother sins, then go and confront him in private between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of one or two or three witnesses, every word may be confirmed. And that's exactly what that first husband did. He went to that party and he confronted this person that had sinned. And, and he said, you know, it, hopefully we can get this straight here. If not, I'm going to bring others into this. But you know what we tend to do? If you're like me, you tend to skip that first step. We want to go tell other people what happened. Oh, man, I saw this thing, and now i got to go tell these people. And that was the mistake I made in that second case, because I should have gone back to that lady, not her husband. It wasn't time to bring him in yet. He wasn't aware of what was going on. And I could have gone to her and said, you know, obviously I'm aware of what's going on here. And I'm going to challenge you to, you tell your husband what's going on. And give her a certain amount of time. And if you, if you aren't able to do that, I'm going to have to tell him. But giving her that chance, instead, I went outside of that. I went, I didn't go, I didn't take that first step. And that marriage didn't work out. Now there were other issues involved, but I have to wonder if that wasn't one of the main reasons. And that was the same mistake that Ham makes with his father. He sees, okay, my father's been drinking, he's gotten drunk, he's uncovered himself, and now what do I do? Well, he should have confronted his father. He should have just gone one-on-one -on -one with him and said, Dad, you know what, I think there, maybe there's a problem here, and talk that out with him. Instead, what did he do? Went and told his brothers, hey, you know what I just saw? Now, they weren't aware of what was going on. They weren't part of the solution yet, anyway. And so they did the right thing. I mean, they didn't want to see this thing. So they put a, a blanket on their shoulders and walked backwards and got the thing covered up. But when Noah awoke from his wine, it says he knew what his younger son had done to him. He had betrayed his trust. He had gone outside of this. He had blabbed it all to the whole world, honestly. I mean, there weren't that many people in the world at that time. So, you know, we have to be careful that we don't make those same mistakes. Ham should have kept his mouth shut, at least to begin with. Now, in Proverbs 25, 2, it, is, it says, It is to the glory of God to conceal a matter. There's a time when we just kind of need to, to keep our mouths shut. To so just keep it within a little circle. Proverbs 11, 13 says, He who goes about as a talebearer reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy conceals matters. Proverbs 17, 9. He who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates intimate friends. And I've seen that happen. Uh, Proverbs 26, 20. For, I love this verse. For lack of wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no whisperer, 
contention dies down. And so, you know, if you want to keep something flamed up and going, it's, it's whispering, it's gossip, it's sharing with people that aren't part of the solution. That keeps the fire going. But you know what? If we just keep our mouth shut, the fire dies out uh, if there's no fuel. And you all remember Joseph, Mary and Joseph, and the story of, of Christmas and Jesus being born. But there was a situation there where Joseph and Mary were engaged to be married, and Mary turns up pregnant. And it says that Joseph, being a righteous man, desired to put her away secretly. He wasn't going to blab it all over. He wasn't going to you know, put it on Facebook. He desired to put her away secretly. So what was Ham's mistake? He went to his brothers. He told the two brothers outside. In other words, they weren't inside the tent like he was. And he should have confronted Noah personally. It's the same mistake that I made with that, that second story I told you. Now, what did Noah do wrong? Noah was not guiltless in this whole thing either. First of all, he got drunk. And we talked about that last time. We went pretty much in detail about that. We're not going to go over that again, but it was a mistake. It was, he was not perfect. Now we're told before the flood that Noah was a righteous man. And that he was a preacher of righteousness. And sometimes, if you're like me, you get the idea that the people in Scripture were just perfect. That they had no faults and that they are these heroes of the faith and that they need to be honored and that everything they did was right. But that's not true. They need to be honored. They are heroes of the faith. But they were people just like you and I, and they had sin in their life. And Noah was not perfect. He got drunk. He uncovered himself. And then he lost his cool. Uh, and speaking of uncovering himself, you know, there are consequences when we become intoxicated. We lose those natural inhibitions that keep us on the straight and narrow. And that was true with Noah as well. And so uh, we just need to be sober. As the, the Bible warns us many times, be sober, be on the alert. Well, Noah, not only that, but he lost his cool. He got embarrassed. His reputation was damaged. I mean, the whole world now knows that he's a drunk and that he's uncovered himself and he, he's embarrassed. And he's been publicly humiliated. And that is a devastating thing. And uh, I would just say this about our culture, because we live in a day and age now with social media where, you know what, some little thing can get completely blown out of proportion, and once you put something on Instagram or, you know, Facebook or you name it, I, I don't know, Twitter, all the different ones, many of these social media, once you put it out there, you can't get it back. It's out there for good. For good or for evil. And you and I both know stories where people have been devastated. Reputations have been destroyed by what somebody just thought, well, maybe, maybe my friends would like to see this. Maybe there's somebody that would get a, get a kick out of this. And people have even committed suicide because they've been so devastated over it. So we need to be careful about the social media, just commentary on the side. Um, so, but Noah was not righteous in what he did, in the way he reacted. He got angry. He got, he was kicked off. And we are told not to curse even our enemies, even our worst enemies. We're not to curse. It says in Romans 12, 14, bless those who are your friends. No, bless those who persecute you. Bless and curse not. Now, Noah gives a blessing to a couple of his sons, but he gives a cursing to Canaan. And parents, grandparents, I would encourage you, be careful to bless your children. It's the words that we say to our kids. It's amazing. At my stage in life now, where I'm a bit older, and now my kids have come back to me and said, Dad, do you remember when you said blah, 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 blah? And you know what? I don't remember it. But they do. They remember it forever. And the same way with, with my 
father, I've gone to him. I said, Dad, do you remember that time when you... No, he doesn't remember. But I'll tell you what, it, may, it impacted me for life. And so we have to be careful what we say. And, and this, certainly that was true with Noah. Noah's curse affected the descendants of Canaan for generations, for hundreds of years. Canaan was the perpetual enemy of Israel and were, in fact, their servants, just as Noah said here at the very beginning. It went on for years and years. Through the days of David and Solomon, the Canaanites were the enemies. Well, Goliath was a Canaanite. Um, no, enemy of David. And they became the servants of Israel, and that went on even through Solomon's day and, and perhaps even further. So, secondly, not only are we not to curse anyone, as Noah did, but we are never to repay evil for evil. Romans 12, 17 says, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Not even your worst enemy. It doesn't say that, but I, I added that. Uh, why did Noah curse Canaan instead of Ham? Now, Ham was the guy that, that came in and, and saw Noah and then told the brothers. He was the perpetrator. But notice that Noah does not curse Ham. He curses Canaan. And who was Canaan, by the way? Well, if you read further, you find out that Canaan was the youngest son of Ham. Now, Ham was Noah's youngest son. We're told here. And so Noah said, you know what, Ham? You're my youngest son, and you greatly disappointed me. So you know what? I'm going to pay you back. I'm going to have your youngest son greatly disappoint you. I'm going to curse your youngest son. I'm going to get back at you. He was repaying evil for evil. We should never, never do that. Now, in conclusion, I would say, if you're convicted by this today, join the crowd, because I am as well. I've been guilty of these things. I've been guilty of telling they're letting people in on something that they had no business knowing. I've not always been perfect about that. I mean, I try to keep people's confidence as a pastor. That's what I'm supposed to do. But there have been times where I've told things that I shouldn't have told. And you've done that too, if you're truthful with yourself. We've all done it. It's a temptation that we all have. When these dirty little secrets come our way, we have a temptation to spread the word to other people, and we should not do that. So if you're convicted by that, yeah, join the crowd. And the other thing is, uh, yeah, have you ever repaid evil for evil to someone? Have you ever given somebody back what they deserve? Yeah, we all have done that. We're all tempted to do that. That's really God's job. He says in Romans 12, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. It's not our job to do that. It's our job to bless and curse not. And so if you're guilty of that, then join the crowd because we're all guilty of betraying others' confidence, others' trust. We've heard dirty little secrets. We've been tempted to pass them along. When someone has embarrassed us or betrayed our trust, we've been tempted to lash out, to curse and return evil for evil. And you know what? That's why we all need a Savior. Every one of us, right? Yeah, amen. Uh, and if you're here today and you've never realize that. You've never said, you know what? I do need a Savior. I'm not perfect. I've been guilty of these things. You've never received Christ as your Savior, who paid the price, by the way, for all of our sins. Not just these, but everything. He went to the cross. That's why He went to the cross. He took on our sins. He paid them in full, so that when judgment day comes, we stand before God, and He says, Steve, Look at all the ways you messed up, man. And I can just say, that's right, Lord, I did. But you know what? Jesus paid the price for my sin. And I claim that. I believe in that. And he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Why? Because I'm such a great guy? No. Because the Lord paid the price. If you've never received him as... Savior, we encourage you to come forward. Mary, you want to come up and lead us in our uh, final chorus? Let's all stand. And it's just simple as what Steve said.